No, it's not possible. Not you. A chaos sorcerer yelled towards Magnus, walking a few steps back in inescapable fear. Enough games, Ariman. You are more valuable to me alive. Magnus answered in a calm and stoic voice, and the flames engulfing the Emperor's sword died down. They turned you, it was all a scam, father. They'll burn your soul on that monstrous warp light, for the glory of the corpse emperor. I failed you. The man sobbed and fell to his knees. Magnus glanced towards Terra, then back at his wayward son. Corpse? You can read the future as well as I can, Araman. My father has already opened his eyes. By tomorrow, he will walk again. I'm going to be lonely without you, father. But I guess, you'll always light my way. Araman answered in a sad voice, then crumbled to the ground, armor shattering to reveal nothing inside. Another rubric. Well, killing Araman would be quite a pain, I suspected. With the leading sorcerer gone and the silent sisters already locking hands for their counter-ritual, my task on Luna was over. I flicked my hand and collected my regiments inside the tesseract, then scanned the place for something worth stealing. It took a while and some luck, but I did find a gene library with exabytes of experiment data and some old history tomes, going from the 10th to the 30th millennium. Quite valuable, the history books, since most of that era's knowledge had been lost or vanished. But then, the Selenites have never been completely loyal, and hundreds of small cabals and cults still resisted imperial compliance to this day. And going by some hidden altars and blood sacrifices strewn around, Araman and his band had helped to arrive on Luna. A step later, I arrived beside Magnus. There are a dozen chaos altars on the moon, Primarch Magnus. I believe you know how to locate them and the perpetrators. I spoke in a casual voice. Pef Lancefire. My son, I never seen anyone terrify him, like you did. Magnus answered while weighing the sword in his hand. Oh? Why would a big bad sorcerer be scared of a young Astartes, one with less than a century of service? I asked in a confused voice, while tesseracting the god-killer weapon into my own hand. A second later, I vanished from Luna and appeared at the gates of Polaris Fortress Crypt belonging to the Titanicus Tyrannic Ordo Sinister. Then, I knocked politely on the armored door, even though I could sense nothing behind the door. A metallic face appeared in bar relief on the door, eyes glowing with the familiar blue lights of the cult Maconicus. This installation is restricted, Astartes. You shouldn't even know of its existence. The machine spirit voiced in an angry tone. And yet, look at this sword in my hand. And also, I answered with faint amusement while opening the null box on my chest and revealed the cog-shaped rosette. The device does not mean what you think it means, Pef Lancefire. Nobility Secundus, Terran Holdings equals 974 square meters, Falkland Islands, Southern Promontory, Agent of the Throne, Ordo Zeno's Tertiary Class, Lamenta Chapter Master, on probation, pending Adeptus Terra Review, and Unsanctioned Rogue Trader. Expired warrant of trade, 47.51 years. However, current records indicate you have entered the Golden Throne twice, and the presence of the Emperor himself on your chapter's space fort. The machine spirit explained in a rather not impressed tone. I might have gulped a little, and drew back my hand away from the irate door. It wouldn't do to get electrocuted because my warrant had expired. Which made little sense too, because the things did not have an expiration date, on them. Did you just hack the administratum central cogitator to read on my info? I asked instead. Call it intuition, but I doubted Astarte's internal data was easily accessed by every door lock. Especially that part about my probation. Only a Primarch could demand a review, and there were other few Primarchs around. We shall never discuss this event ever again. And look, your warrant of trade has just gained 974 more years of unsupervised operations in the Eastern Fringe. Now, why are you bothering me? The metal face asked with a scowl. I blinked in surprise then shrugged. The Emperor certainly liked playing with fire. In this case, a rogue AI, in charge of his side titan's security. I need a pair of side titans, to deploy in defense of the Imperial Palace. The pacification sirens in particular, since killing a few trillion citizens driven mad and angry by chaos sorcery wouldn't please the Emperor especially on terror. The blue eyes measured me for a long second. 
In AI terms, it probably reviewed my service record and all known data points about my life a few hundred times. Your request had been sent to the preceptor intendant. Major Sysource Revolt confirmed, Titan assets engaged with traitor forces, pending. Request approved. Polaris Albedalak will deploy at the Nepal entrance. Stand clear of the door. The machine spirit demanded in a rather surprised voice. The next second, the door vanished and another dimensional portal appeared in its place, to reveal a giant warlord titan stepping out. I moved myself on its head, and sat myself down comfortably. The transport lander will arrive in 3.14 minutes. Be advised, riding on top of a titan can be dangerous to your life and or sanity. The princeps spoke via his voxcasters. I'm good, princeps. But there's no need to wait for a lander. I explained with a wry voice, then snapped my fingers. The next second, we arrived right in front of the Imperial Palace, with Las Cannons flaring the void shields of the Psy Titan in the next second. Uck! I hate teleports. They make me sick to the stomach. And then, I get cranky and take it out on other people. Especially if they shoot at Al Bedalak. The blank princeps inside the cockpit commented with a caustic voice, followed by a low drumming sound that made my hairs stand up. That might be the titanic capacitors cycling, or some psychic weapon charging. I had a wary suspicion of the latter. The golden armors are with us, big guy. The enemy is the other way, I yelled while tapping the armored head with my glove. Riding a titan was rather exciting. I can recognize the Adeptus Custodes too, wise guy. Hang on. The princeps shouted and spun the titan around, its claws gouging deep trenches to keep itself balanced. And then it jumped, clearing the adamantium walls and rushing right in the middle of the traitor army. Some unfortunate guys got stomped into the hard rock of the Himalayas, until the Psy Titan reached his optimal range and sounded its Psy Sirens. It's hard to describe the effects, as there was nothing visible. But in less than a minute, incoming fire died out, while soldiers and cultists dropped their weapons and fell to their knees, weeping and sobbing. This beast was absolutely the king of crowd control and the invisible sounds kept propagating for dozens of kilometers, rolling down the abrupt slopes and pacifying entire feral armies. Another minute, to make sure they never do it again. But I believe the mission is complete. The princeps declared in a proud voice, happy with an easy job. I grinned widely at his silly naivety. Capacitors already out of energy? I asked instead. Don't talk crazy, Lamenta. This baby can go on for years at this rate. The blank princeps replied in a proud voice. Years you say. I suspect we'll have a lot of fun together. I commented in a wry voice, and moved us to the next gate. Bhutan. They have tanks here. And that is a bane blade. The pilot yelled in a rather alarmed voice, as a heavy caliber shell struck the armored greaves of the sight titan. So, you can't do it? Mission fail? I asked in a teasing tone. Oh, dear god emperor. I can't fail a mission. They'll take him away from me, damn silly traitors. Repent. The princeps yelled and kicked the bane blade away, while blaring negasi vibes from all its available ports. It took us a whole day to visit all the entrances into the imperial palace, making a giant ruckus wherever we went and leaving sobbing and repenting guardsmen and other gangsters, criminals and cultists, to be collected by arbiters or the inquisition. Well, I almost consumed 1% of the capacitors. But the Alpha Psychers are still fresh, so they can go back to stasis. I'm going to remember this day for a long time, Lamenta. It was rather fun. The blank princeps admitted in more friendly voice. Indeed, it's not every day you get to walk around in public, and terrify people with those Psy Sirens. But did you think the mission is over? I asked rhetorically. No. You cannot do this, Pef Lancefire. There are rites and canticles for maintenance. Plus the energy reserves are getting low. The pilot pleaded in a pitiful voice. But I never visited Saturn. I heard the rings are amazing. I offered as an excuse, and began our new adventure. Only this time, it was demons. Big ones too. Let's go help the sisters too. I urged the tired princeps as soon as the last greater demon fell and dissipated into purple gas. A single sob of helplessness answered me. 
Just as I snapped my fingers to move us in front of the main cathedral of the order underscore of underscore the underscore shattered underscore glass, on Enceladus. Thousands of sisters of battle, supported by rhinos and flamer tanks were battling a large army of chaos cultists and lesser demons, led by a towering blue bird with hundreds of eyes on its feathers. Sadly for the sisters, these demons were mostly immune to flames, and the brave women were running out of stamina to wield melee weapons, while their bolt rounds had been expended hours ago. A small twist with the tesseract, and the sisters were regrouped behind the Psi Titan and safe from the deadly Psi Lance. A dark beam of immaterium burst from the titan's left arm, popping millions of demons like soap balloons, while the mighty force claw on the right arm slashed to the Zeonch's greater demon. However, the bird-like warp spawn had its own tricks, and the Alpha Psychers powering the Psi Titan were nearly spent. The claw struck only vapor and illusion, while the demon reappeared high above the battlefield, cackling with mirth. I clenched my hand on the handle of my sword, and orange flames engulfed the holy flame. Flame on. I whispered in my mind, and crossed the dimensional labyrinth in a millisecond, then struck the bird straight on its head. The emperor's sword bounced off painfully and flew out from my hand, and landed at the feet of a teenage girl. Don't do it, silly girl. I whispered to myself while vanishing from my compromised spot. But of course, she did. Her slim hand could barely lift the mighty weapon, and stood no chance at blocking a greater demon's strike. She didn't even have a light power armor, wearing only the robes of a novice, and a guardsman's flak helmet. I could almost see the girl get shredded into strips of bloody meat by the incoming claws. Then, a golden beam of blinding light erupted from that weapon, fractally splitting off into millions of smaller branches, all the way to the horizon and beyond. The girl fell to her knees, still alive and murmuring a prayer. However, there were no more enemies to fight, on this moon or anywhere else in Saturn's orbit. From Mimas to Iapetus, the miracle had erased all trace of the warp and Vaders. I sighed inward and turned my tesseract's focus onto the Blackstone Fortress. The reception hall doors were now open, and the Emperor and of Rain were discussing something over a paper-like map of the galaxy swirls of energy painting new borders and tracing thin red lines of ellipses and tangents. The emperor glanced directly at me, then returned to his negotiations. Well then, let's hope he was still sane, my new emperor to be. I stepped beside the miraculous sister, and helped her to her feet just as the gigantic side titan took a single step and parked itself next to us. Are you all right? I asked still holding her hand. Never felt better my lord, she whispered in an awed voice. I raised her chin to make sure, and found her eyes glowing with an inner violet light, just like Janice had. Things have changed, sister. You are not who you were before, and the universe is also much different. The emperor has returned. The girl glanced in surprise at her hand, then towards the emperor's sword, weapon still radiating a warm golden light, if much more subdued now. I didn't know, did I really? she whispered in confusion. I laughed out loud and snatched back the miracle sword. No, it wasn't you. I explained with a snort, and moved the three of us back on terror, right in front of the Nepal entrance of the Imperial Palace, where Sister Stern and my daughter Janice were locked in a standoff, among the burned ruins of the defense bunkers. I'm stronger than you. The demonifuge argued with a cold tone, and a crackling sphere of white lightning formed around her. A Grox is stronger than a man too. Janus replied with a surprised glance at my companions. Especially the giant titan at my back. So I brought out the solitaire harlequin, then stabbed the glowing sword into the ash-filled ground. Janus, your boss needs you on the Black Lament. I spoke calmly, while the new miracle girl took a step back and found the side titan's foot blocking her retreat. This isn't over. Janus muttered and vanished in a purple flash. Well. Technically my daughter was correct, any and all sisters of battle were hers to command as adept at Tertia. But it was also true, Ephrael Stern wasn't a sister of battle anymore, despite her uniform. She just didn't know it yet. There only one Psyche still alive, and just barely. The princeps muttered from his side titan, probably not too certain about his chances against the demonifuge, without fully charged batteries. The solitaire turned to observe the god machine for a second then stepped beside his angry student. We're going to join Pef Lancefire, for a while. Perhaps visit the eastern fringe and work on your temper, 
Again. The Harlequin commanded in a level tone, and stepped through the deadly ball of lightning to pat the woman's head, in a gentle move. A second later, Miss Stern turned off the death spell, and focused her glowing eyes on my hands, still holding the pommel of the holy artifact. So I didn't sense wrong. The Emperor is back. She asked in a curious voice, and came closer. All around us, Auramite clad Custodes and Blackstone plated silent sisters all raised their weapons and held the demonifuge under threat, not that they had much chance of survival if it came to blows. Perhaps ten side titans would be enough to hold her in check, but probably not. Maybe twenty. Or even better, me. You did good, Miss Stern. You earned a hug. I offered in a gentle tone, opening my arms for embrace. Hesitantly, the woman leaned into my arms, muscles still tense and slightly trembling. So I patted her back for a minute, until she got used to my touch and presence. It isn't so bad, is it? I wondered wryly. My hugs were still the best, it seemed. You said I'm pretty. Miss Stern answered in a softer voice. I grabbed her ass in response, then slapped it gently. You have a nice ass too. A surprised growl emerged from her throat, then a shy voice followed. There's never been a man, I mean. I ignored her naive claims and turned my eyes toward the snickering harlequin. You better behave, Eldar. If Rain and the Emperor might be best friends right now, but I value my family above any alliance. The solitaire nodded cautiously and drew his hand away from the glowing sword in the stone, probably reconsidering his next prank, now that the galaxy had changed. Still holding Ephrael in my arms, I turned towards the other sister of battle. What about you, Glass Sister? My name is Darcy. The young girl declared in a high-pitched squeak. It was a decent name for a sidekick, so she could keep it. Great. But I was asking about your future. Wanna follow me, explore the eastern fringe and banish demons or Xenos together? I proposed in a curious voice. The young novice blushed slightly, then nodded. I fell ignored and forgotten up here. Is it because I'm not a pretty girl? The princeps muttered in a morose voice, and leaned its huge titan's head above me. You can join as well, big guy. Not sure about your walker. I'll have to ask the emperor. I mused out loud. I could use a side titan. Maybe even two. The next second, the warlord's sinister side titan vanished, and then reappeared at the entrance into the Polaris crypt. Five of the alpha level psychers had died during the battle of Saturn, and the last one wasn't much better. The poor Titan had taken quite a beating during the day-long engagement and it probably needed a week to be properly restored to full strength. The Ariok power claw had lost three digits to a bloodthirster greater demon who refused to die and bit them off, and the shoulder cannons had been ripped off by two squid-like greater demons, probably belonging to Slanch. Yeah, a chaos invasion wasn't easy to defeat, and without me being there to move the Titan out of danger at critical moments, it would have been destroyed. These god machines were amazingly strong and durable, but not invincible. The Blank Princeps knew it too, because five other side titans had been lost till now, and always to chaos forces. Of course, I didn't linger about, and test how the AI in charge of the side titans would react to its baby being returned in a battered state. I just saluted the gathered custodes and tesseracted away, back on board the Singularity battleship. Lord Lancefire. This is a Zeno. Archmago's cowl noted in an angry tone, and his famous power racks crackled with electricity as a counterpoint to the presence of the Harlequin. And I am a rogue trader, I said in a casual voice, just as Dreadnought Charon arrived at a brisk walk. I shall provide quarters and security for our guests. The Lamenter captain voiced from his walking coffin. I just nodded and gestured towards the main hallway. Soon enough. Ephrael and Darcy were being led towards their new homes, with the solitaire tiptoeing after them, hands tucked into his large pockets like he was on a stroll. Hopefully he could keep the pranks at a minimum, for now. You heard about the machine forge, Dominatus Dominus. I wondered out loud. The tech priest nodded in a cautious manner, and held a familiar data slate out. The one I gave to Primarch Guleman some decades ago. Quite a lot of discoveries on this tablet. Lord Lancefire. Some of them bear the definite markings of Zen origin. I just shrugged. I've seen the Golden Throne, Tech Priest. 
Half of it is made from Xenotech, and your fellow tech priests have no idea how to repair it. Not to mention the Eternity Gate or the Imperial Webway. Belisarius Cal sighed painfully and motioned at me to follow after him. A minute later we descended at the base of the Void Claw, the ancient weapon able to shoot singularities, as projectiles or even sustained beams. This is the weapon you recovered from Vigilus. I see someone had made some modifications to it, miniaturization of the atomantic shielding, triple buffer capacitors, scalable yield, surge protections against static or dynamic overload and hundreds of others tiny changes. Who did this? He asked in a rather upset voice. I smiled a bit too wide. A friend. The same friend worked on your helmet's visor, I suspect. He asked with a piercing gaze at the helmet hanging on my belt. Yes. He is quite shy and orange. I explained in a mild voice. Yes. Joe Caro Smiths tend to leave subtle hints of their origin into their artifacts. The problem is, they can also deactivate the objects they've worked on with a single thought. Or make them explode. He warned me, while popping open a panel into the side of the giant space gun. Thin red and orange lines formed a childish painting depicting a sunburst, and then the painted lines vanished deep among the cables and solid estate circuits of the ancient weapon. Some kind of special paint? I asked, back in savant mode. Psycho-reactive paint, yes. I backtracked the tracker signal to its source. The control node was originally somewhere in the eastern fringe, but has now moved towards the Eye of Terror. Belisarius Cowell explained while projecting a minimalistic galactic map and pointing at a moving dot. The trajectory lead right to Solemnus and a certain Necron overlord with a whole company of Joe Caro in his service. And there was a single possible destination for him and his own Blackstone fortress. Cadia. Makes sense. I mused to myself in a thoughtful voice. Trizen the Infinite had arranged to place a self-destruct into my void claw, before heading towards the main event in the galaxy. Some kind of empathic subversion of my Joe Caro Smith, undetectable and subtle. Well, if it makes sense to you, then everything is all right, Lord Lancefire. But I assume you'd want to defuse the bomb? He asked in a wry voice. If you can fake an intact signal to continue and do not alert the target, the survival of this ship is much less important than the task at Cadia. I explained with a shrug, and started to turn away. I have already done that while you were riding that silver titan all over the system. The recordings on Saturn were quite amazing, for a machine not used by Cult Maconicus. The tech priest complained with a rather envious voice. You can ask the Emperor about the side titan. He is back on his feet now. I answered with a shrug and vanished. My strange teleport powers were on record now, so no point avoiding using them. Same with the existence and powers of the side titans. I have always found it stupid to hide the existence of major weapons from your own people, if you were already using them on your enemies. I mean, the enemy already knew of their existence and general type of powers. A moment later, I arrived beside Inquisitors Rosalia and Villain, who were also busy discussing advanced politics with their counterparts in the Eldar delegation, Phoenix Lords, Exalts, Autarchs, and Farseers. For once, I kept my mouth shut and just observed in silence, as prisoner and captive transfers were being arranged, ships being transferred over, spirit stones traded over for various imperial relics, scent bones and relic artifacts worth as much as a planet if not more. I should ask for your head, Astartes, but it would be more pleasant to collect it myself. A black armored Eldar woman muttered towards me in contempt. You're a phoenix lord? I wondered curious. These people were the equivalent of a human primarch in the Eldar culture, with giant temples and huge numbers of followers. I am Jain underscore Tsar. The alien woman answered in a dignified voice. I shrugged at that, since the name told me nothing. Are you stronger than an avatar? I asked while scratching my cheek. A pair of green eyes blinked in confusion at my question. Are you? She answered in a defiant voice. I held out my hand and balanced it in midair. Probably the same level, I'd say. The avatar of Cain was rather friendly, so we never got to testing our strength, when we burned down Kamora together. Who knows, maybe Yukani will be a challenge. Twenty pairs of eyes locked onto me and my absurd claims, while giants are blinked in confusion again. Go away Peth. Primarch Sanguinius wanted a word with you, 
Rose demanded with a pained voice, like I have broken some hidden taboo or something. Well, might as well leave before I was set on fire. Even though this space fortress was my home. With a twist of space-time, I moved myself beside Sanguinius, who was in the middle of a staff meeting with a hundred high-ranking generals, admirals and other adeptus terror of various factions. Peflant's fire. Had enough fun gallivanting around the Sol system? The Primarch asked in a mild voice. Well, he was always that way, even while chopping off your head. Cool guy, my Primarch. I was told to deal with the invaders, Lord Sanguinius. Primarch Gulaman himself, with his own words. I answered in a level voice. Sanguinius almost sighed, and patted my head in a fatherly manner. So this is where Ludvius got the gesture from. Never mind then. Go to Cadia and deal with the invaders as well. If you need more troops or ships, we have plenty to spare right here. He explained with an inviting gesture towards the gathered staff. My eyes swept the gathered officers and officials for someone of real use. You command the Eindometer's fleet Tertius, right? I asked Fleetmaster Cassandra underscore Van Lescus. I do, Lord Lancefire. Nine battle cruisers and eighty-four cruisers, all upgraded with warpless engines. The weapon batteries are not upgraded though. She replied in a dignified tone. I nodded in understanding. The navy rarely got the best deal, as they were rather prone to defections, mutiny and even turning to chaos. I will need some auger teams of the Templars underscore psychologists and a pair of agents from the Synopticon. Maybe a Calexus assassin, if there's one available in system, I continued in the same tone, watching Sanguinius hide a faint smile. Yeah, he knew I didn't actually need intelligence and subversion operatives, nor pariah killers to go after chaos demons or sorcerers. But he wouldn't say that now, after he basically gave me a free hand to pick my team. Anything else, Lord Lancefire? Sanguinius asked in a pleasant voice. I pretended to think about it for a moment. A pair of those psychic titans. And especially the pilot of Polaris Albedalak. We worked great together. We all saw your exploits, my son. Very well, Sanguinius agreed, with a nod towards a white and silver dressed inquisitor with a black glove on his left hand. And this inquisitor was a blank as well. Only then I realized how stupid I must have looked, with my low level rosette, trying to impress the gate guard. Ordo Sinistrum was part of the Inquisition. The black left hand of the Emperor. The left hand of darkness. Preparations for the departure continued over the next week, sometimes overtly, with navy ships moving in formation with the Lamenta fleet at Jupiter, and supply vessels bringing aboard extra rations, torpedoes and nova shells. Other preparations were more covered, stealth shuttles docking in secret with a singularity and unloading their mysterious payload of operatives and advanced machine spirits. For example, the pair from the Synopticon was formed from a fully mechanical engine seer, with no organic matter at all inside, and teenage-looking boy with green hair and a single data slate hanging from his belt. The boy walked right to me and examined me for a minute. At least you have a mind implant, Astartes. Perhaps this mission will not make me tear my hair out, again, he declared in a superior tone. I smiled kindly, and switched to manifold circuit talking. Just make sure we have advanced warning if the navy ships go traitor. Do you need special clearance to install your Vox Thieves and whatever surveillance devices you normally use? With a wry smirk, the boy glanced at his mechanical companion. I stole this Sicarian underscore infiltrator and upgraded it with the best tech available in the Imperium. It even has Clavis overrides for secure vault surveillance. There is basically nowhere it cannot go. And I also want pressure plates installed around the main reactors and the Gellerfield's generators. Even invisible enemies have to step on the floor, sometimes. I added with a second glance at the subverted infiltrator. The boy was a geek, but a competent one going by this exploit. Stealing from the Maconicus was never easy. A string of code and green engrams flashed over the irises of the green-haired boy, and the machine cloaked itself and ran off, then vanished into a quite small air duct. I could keep track of it with the Tesseract vision, but otherwise I would have taken a miracle to detect the invisible infiltrator. I'll be in my room, writing the new parameters for this mission, my lord. Potential enemies? The boy asked in a bored voice. Mainly Necron, Elder, and Chaos. Perhaps some human faction as well, 
Officio Sabatorum, Assassinorum, and Ordo Hereticus, Navigators and Dark Angels too. I revealed with a careless shrug. I did have plenty potential enemies. The boy scratched his head in a rather comical display of confusion. I'm not a miracle worker, Astartes. You better have some skill and luck of your own. He muttered in a tragic tone, and walked off without looking at me or around him at all. Eyes glued to his data slate, and already adding more variables to his spying engrams. A couple of hours later, I was lounging in the armchair, studying the hololith map of Cadia and its star system. Chaos and the Imperium had battled over the fortress world for millennia and there was plenty of data to go through. The map is not the territory, Lord Lancefire. The Cadians themselves are the walls that defend humanity from chaos. A gruff voice spoke over my shoulder. I didn't turn or give any sign of surprise. After all, I did ask for a Calexus assassin. Cadia, is not an imperial fortress, assassin. Terra still had dinosaurs roaming its jungles, when Cadia was being fortified. The Catan tasked the Necrons to construct the Blackstone Pillars, as part of their flat universe plan. I mused out loud, while highlighting the thousand of gigantic pillars raising into lower orbit. So, the pillars themselves are the weapons. Blackstone is famous for withstanding warp damage and your ships are covered in it. Would the pillars work against a chaos incursion? Dispel demons or suffocate psychers like a tyrannid silence? The voice asked, seeming curious. Probably they would. As a minor side effect. Anyway, your task is separate from this future battle. Araman. He is very difficult to kill, as he can shift timelines and vanish, leaving only an empty armor in his place. Thus, our plan must never threaten his life and close the second timeline. Or better said, we must catch him twice. I explained to the pariah assassin. Well, this is the first time I've been called to make sure my target doesn't die. But I am only one man, and can be in just one place. I hope you realize that, Pef Lancefire. The man answered in a thoughtful voice. Three rooms down the hall, there's a solitaire Harlequin. He'll be the first timeline hammer, with Sister Stern as the bait. She can resurrect, so plan for it as well, I said in a casual voice, then focused back on the map. The Cadians, yeah. They would not break, that was true. Now, what would Trezin do? I had to plan for the actions of a lunatic, and that wasn't going well. Then, Inquisitor Greyfax will arrive as well, with her Custodes in tow. Plan for a miracle? Yeah, not something really reliable, was it? Not for me, at least. My own sword lost its powers in a critical moment, just to give Darcy her moment of faith. It was hard to plan around the Emperor, as he worked in mysterious ways. Still, he would send a saint again. He liked showing off. Probably Saint Celestine, or maybe young Darcy again. Slowly, I began smiling as the fragments of a plan began assembling in my mind. Now that would be a great trick to play. I held my left hand out, the armored glove filtering the dim light of the hologram and casting a dark shadow. Five Primarchs held in the Tesseract Labyrinth. Angron, Lorga, Perturabo, Mortarian held by me. And Fulgrim, with the Necron Lord. It could work. I remembered the giant hand emerging from the Hadex anomaly when it was forcefully closed. Definitely an enraged chaos god, most likely Khorne. Now, Angron was himself a demon prince of Khorne. Would his sacrifice enrage Khorne enough? My guts said yes. The Empyrean construct was made of fury and carnage. The Blackstone Fortress itself was a weapon meant to kill gods, warp gods too with some help. You seem quite satisfied with yourself, Lord Lancefire. The Calexus assassin observed in a level voice, once again appearing above my shoulder. You have a name, my friend? I asked instead, turning a centimeter to catch the pariah in my peripheral vision. The assassin hesitated for a second, then removed his animus speculum helmet to show a young face with a dozen brain implants scarring his bald head. I am named Vadrex now. You are a blank yourself, so you earned a modicum of thrust for that. Plus your adventures with the Psy Titan were rather fun. He disclosed with a wry smile. I smiled back. Not usually my style, but my warrant of trade was expired and my chapter master rank is under review. Most likely the lion. I don't think he likes me much. I disclosed as well, 
and took out a bottle of expensive wine and a pair of crystal glasses, illegal loot from Vigilus both. Perks of the job. Vadrex sipped the expensive wine with a faraway look. A publicity stunt, with two Primarchs watching. Plus the Inquisition and the visiting Eldar. I'd say it worked just fine. I shrugged and sipped my wine in turn. The Emperor wasn't that pleased, seeing how he denied me the full use of his sword. Darcy might be innocent and cute, but even miracles had a reason. Which is why I planted his sword in front of his house and left it there. Let's see who dares draw that sword from the stone. Late into the night, a pair of transport landers rose from Terra and made their way to the Black Lament, each carrying a Psy Titan. Come alone. Biggie demanded straight into my mind. I was a little drunk, but I had to go anyway. The Emperor calls, my friend. See you later. I muttered and vanished from my room. A second later, Canis arrived next to me, for moral support. Always show strength, and not a hair of fear. You don't listen well, do you? The Emperor muttered with a mild voice, and waved his hand to put Canis to sleep. Should I be impressed? He could put mountains to sleep with the same gesture. I leaned on the giant wolf, and raised my eyes towards the god emperor of mankind. Which is why I have Canis. His hearing is very acute. I muttered in a casual voice. Moral support. Plus you're a bit drunk. Do you want the good news, Pef Lancefire? He asked with faint amusement. I am no longer under review. I answered in a cold tone. That too. But no. The measure of a man, I found, is in how many enemies he manages to have, and still live. Do you even know? The Emperor asked with a short laugh. I shook my head and tried to count, losing a few perhaps. A hundred? I guessed at random. This mission to Cadia. Those tesseracts on your glove will not work. You can't catch dreams in different dimension, he said with a sad head shake. So I missed my guess. I have never lost a battle, Big E. I'll be fine. I muttered in a slurry voice. Not my best job interview, perhaps. His eyes glowed golden, and I fell asleep. You're an idiot, my son. But don't worry, you're my idiot now, he whispered in mind while my soul floated above my body a bit confused. A dimensional crystal the size of fingernail detached from my glove, and my collection of Primarchs and other precious prisoners was gone. I felt a bit sad. Are you magpie, deep inside? What the hell is all this? The Emperor growled while examining my collection of relics, weapons, xenos and forbidden artifacts. I couldn't actually answer, you know, without a body or a brain. A second later, my null box opened on my chest, revealing the other valuables, like my warrant of trade, a mostly useless rosette, a pair of digital weapons and a few locks of hair. This, your mother. I see. His voice mused in a lower tone, just as Janice appeared beside him, looking at my body but not at me. She couldn't see me. You said. She pleaded with a frightened voice. I did. But now I know more. Your father fed me to Catan. Billions of years of knowledge. My sons will be able to defeat any foes now. It's only fair I start with him. The Emperor explained while plunging his hand into my chest. It hurt a little. I couldn't really tell, but it sure didn't look healthy. I woke up in the hospice ward, with Sister Helena holding my hand at her warm bosom. As things go, it could have been much worse. I'm not sick, am I? I wondered while reviewing the data logs through the machine spirit of the Black Lament. The reception party had moved elsewhere, and only the Lamenters and my house troops were still on board. Well, it wasn't like the Emperor needed a ship, even one as nice as my Blackstone fortress. But he did take my two tesseracts, and most of my precious loot, and that hurt a little. My heart was bleeding deep inside, which fit perfectly with the Lamenter heraldry. The third tesseract on my Aquila necklace was still there, with my good loot and supplies for my troops. This was the one I have recovered from Kamara. I could work with a single tesseract labyrinth and nine trillion thrones as a starting capital. I did start with much less after all. I was even born naked and powerless, like all babies. Sick. You'll never be sick again, my lord. The faithful sister whispered in a soft voice, then walked out and left me check my body by myself. For a second, I was worried about my progenoid glands, and checked for them. Still there. 
Excellent news, for once. I rushed to the bathroom and checked myself all over. My muscles had their own muscles now, and I could sense a few extra organs deep inside my body. And inside the brain too. I was also a head taller than I recalled, probably to make room inside for the extra gear. Almost the height of a midget Astartes now, which fit me just fine. Still, I wasn't the same as my Astartes sons, or even the Custodes. No black carapace ports, no progenoid glands in the neck, and more importantly the junk still worked just fine. I'll have to thank Janice for putting a good word for my jewels. While admiring the work of the Emperor, I sensed Lady Villain enter my hospice ward. I'm in the refresher, I shouted as she seemed a bit worried at the empty bed. A second later, she crossed the room and joined me. You look, good, Villain whispered and even managed to blush a little. I grinned widely and turned on the shower. In or out? I demanded in a teasing voice. Much later, she rested on the muscles on top of my pectoral muscles, a bit tired yet rather satisfied. I was tasked to keep you company, Pef. And keep an eye on the Harlequin too. He is not exactly what he seems to be. The Inquisitor disclosed before falling asleep like a cat on her favorite pillow. Gently I set her aside, and moved myself into my quarters, nearly stepping on an invisible assassin curled at the base of the door. Canis was also sleeping on his furs, and opened a lazy eye to show he noticed me. There's a bed right here, Vadrax. I commented in wry tone, while picking at the wardrobe for something loose that would still fit my larger body. A katakan style fatigue uniform would do, for now. It's what I also used to dress up a couple of Primarchs who didn't have proper clothes and armor just yet. The man rose to his feet and dispelled the Aetherium cloak, then glanced at Canis with a frown. Can't you use the door, like everyone else? And why are you so big? Call it a growth spurt, my friend. The Emperor helped too. I answered in a snarky voice, while trying to find a larger pair of boots in my dimensional inventory. The Calexus assassin pointed a finger at me and did some type of nega warp spell. My skin tingled in response and a shield formed around me, like an invisible bubble. You're much stronger now. My temple recruits people of this strength. He revealed with a surprised voice. I bet he didn't mean my new muscles. I thought you guys were cloning blanks for your program. I wondered with the right tone, while going to pet my wolf and check him for any lingering damage. But Canis was fine, more than fine. A dozen cuts and burns on his paws had vanished, and he seemed to have become a bit larger and stronger as well. I might need a wider door. Woof? The wolf asked at my curious probing. I just scratched his head and the wolf sighed in delight. We can clone blanks, but there are risks and nasty failures sometimes. The temple prefers natural operatives, whenever possible. Vadrax muttered in a low voice. I turned to check on him, and noticed a faint smile at the corner of his mouth. So this is where I'm supposed to offer my family for the program. Natural blanks are quite rare, and most get killed before you can find them, I concluded with a sigh of my own. Perhaps being smarter wasn't always a blessing. Vadrax nodded a bit cautiously. You did offer hundreds of blanks to various Astartes chapters. He countered. There were contingencies in place, Vadrax. Astartes training kills a thousand recruits for every new space marine. Which is fine when you're sifting through the trash at the bottom of a hive world. Gangers and criminals and the like. Not so fine with my sons. Each of them gets schooling enough to earn them a captain rank and an engine seer title. I explained in a harsher voice. The assassin measured me a bit more thoughtfully. The Calexus cannot afford that kind of waste, since blanks are too rare. But I see your point. You obviously don't. You work alone, or perhaps with a small kill team. Now imagine you could have twenty like you, going after a target. Or a thousand. Or twenty Psy Titans in support, and a fleet of blank Astartes covering you from orbit. I offered with a grim smile. He blinked and stood still, mulling over my words. Well, at least I got something out of it. A million blank Astartes. That would be nice, if at all possible, Vadrax whispered to himself. You're still thinking too small my untouchable friend. We are mostly immune to warp, psychis and various mental interference from enslavers and other parasites. Now imagine the whole of humanity like us. I said in a glorious voice, almost like holding a speech. 
The man sat down on my bed, trying to compute what I was saying. If that's even possible. In a normal world it wouldn't be. But here, we had a galactic-sized dictatorship. Social norms could be changed by decree, and they often were. What was illegal and anathema one day, it became the norm a millennium later, just like the ecclesiarchy had done with the imperial truth, turned into the imperial cult. Turn the untouchables and pariahs into nobles and angels, and people would gladly offer their children to become the new ruling class. I was already doing that in the fringe, with some measure of success. Perhaps I was naive to place my faith in the emperor, but I had faith anyway. And if he wouldn't do it, for some obscure reason, I didn't actually need his help. The blank plan was still going, it would just take longer. I'll have a meal sent over. And don't bother the wolf. He hasn't eaten anyone in weeks. I quipped in a lighter tone, and snapped my fingers by reflex. The Tesseract didn't actually need gestures to work, as it used an empathic connection to its user. But a snap made it look better. See how easy it is for me. I arrived beside the brightest tech priest of them all, Archmago's cowl. I need a new armor, I demanded with a level voice. The cyborg turned to measure me for a second, then glanced up at the sight titan. You'll fit the cockpit just fine, Lord Lancefire. Hop in and let's test the manifold circuit. On the one hand, I wouldn't get a master crafted power armor from him. On the other, I had my own sight titan, made by the emperor himself. I wasn't too sad with my choices. So I just moved myself into the empty cockpit. A second later, the world exploded in my mind, as the mind impulse unit linked up with the machine spirit, but a different type of spirit from my knight. The Syracrux underscore anima converted psychosol energy into motive power and senses, and the sleeping titan had six healthy alpha level psychers to draw from. Options for various titan scale spells opened into my mind, from the Shroud of Terror, the Psy Sirens able to crush souls and revolts with its invisible waves, and up to the Death Pulse Bombs and the Necrotic Ica Temporal Repair spell. A couple more exotic spells like the Quickening Speed Boost and the Antipathic Tempest of Unhallo Lightning could be deployed as well, and that was without getting into the Left Hand of Darkness or Sinistra Manus Tenebrae, a Psy Cannon which resembled a directional Vortex weapon, though without the Vortex part. I have seen it in action on Saturn and even greater demons were killed with it. Well, for as long as the Alpha Psychers lasted, that is. The last spell seemed a bit superfluous. With Biomancy I could drain the life force of everything in a dozen kilometers radius, then fire it at a concentrated beam of soul death, similarly to what the Immaterium Beam of the Blackstone Fortress could do. Well, it would be probably useful if I fell right in the middle of an orc or some tyrannid swarm. The Princeps of Albedalak had no reason to use this spell on demons, or the insane humans besieging the Imperial Palace. My own Psy Titan was named Occidentalis Subates, a name which meant destroyer from the West in ancient Greek. Well, it was certainly a destroyer, as it wasn't built to construct buildings or roads. Below the snarling lion emblem, the Titan had a simple inscription. Ordo Sinister, Pavor Dominator which translates from High Gothic as Masters of Fear. Up and let's take a small walk, Sir Bates. I urged the god machine. The first steps were a bit shaky, but soon my mind adapted to the height difference. But the halls of the fort weren't suited for a test drive. There was plenty of elbow room outside though. I moved us on top of the Black Lament, and began running at full tilt, even engaging the quickening to see how fast I could go. In a single minute I arrived back where I started, while the anima was venting extra heat through the upper cooling coils. Quite fast, comparable to an Astartes jet bike in fact. This was in vacuum though, so air friction would slow the Titan somewhat on the surface of a planet. So I moved myself on Ganymede, the poor moon which had just been incinerated by the Chaos fleet attacking Jupiter. Recovery teams were sifting though the debris, so I went to lend a hand. The right arm of the side titan was in fact a power claw stronger than a thousand excavators, and with my help we soon managed to clear the vitrified sand and molten ferro concrete, to reach the data hub buried under a broken mountain. Want me to kick the door open? I asked in a helpful tone. Please don't, my lord. The records inside are written on paper. A scribe in a bio has a dharma answered at once. Perhaps I should stop helping then. With a wry salute I turned and jumped off, using the lightning storm to glide just like I saw Sister Stern do with her own lightning powers. 
The landing wasn't as smooth as hers, since my titan massed as much as an assault lander. The right knee bent and twisted with a horrible screech. Next time, make a note pef. Jumping from a mountain in a titan wasn't easy of the feet. Oh well. Time to reverse time and fix the injury, right? The necrotic icker spell worked like a charm though, undoing my small mistake and turning the broken foot back into shape. Still, two psychers of the right side were giving off signs of soul trauma, so perhaps not all injuries could be fixed. Nevertheless, I picked up speed and ran for the next mountain, to help yet another recovery team. There were even some ultramarines here, wearing exosuits on top of their power armor for extra digging power. I can lend a hand. I offered in a pleasant voice, and held the giant claw up. Don't damage the vault, Lamenta. Primarch Guleman wants the records intact. An ultramarine sergeant proclaimed while waving his people away. So I scratched the door a little. Big deal. It was only a meter.